Hi everyone, my name is Courtney Owens. I'm one of the third year chief residents at Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I will be talking today on OB emergencies. So why I love emergency medicine, of course, caring for underserved and minority patient populations, the high acuity disease processes that we see in emergency medicine, and I have a particular interest in ultrasound education. So learning objectives, uh, what we will be able to do by the end of this presentation is recognize common presentations of various OB emergencies, to discuss management strategies of obstetrical emergencies occurring before 20 weeks gestation, after 20, 20 weeks gestation, at birth and in the postpartum period. And you should be able to describe the racial and ethnic disparities of common, common various OB emergencies. So let's get started with a few cases. Our first case is a 24 year old female who had a home positive pregnancy test three weeks ago and is coming in after a single episode that occurred at home. On arrival, her blood pressure is 88 over 65. Her heart rate is 133, and she's complaining of diffuse abdominal pain. So take a few minutes and think, what is the most likely diagnosis? And what are your next steps? So this case represents a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. So what is that? It is when you have a ovum that is fertilized that implants somewhere outside of the uterus. The most common location being in the fallopian tube. This should be suspected in any patient presenting with first trimester bleeding, abdominal pain, syncope, and you should especially think of, the, of this diagnosis in patients who have not had a confirmatory ultrasound verifying the pregnancy that is located in the uterus. Evaluation for ruptured ectopic pregnancy often includes labs, which verify pregnancy and beta HCG level, and also ultrasound imaging, which would be looking for whether the pregnancy is inside the uterus. It can oftentimes see ectopic pregnancies, such as those in the fallopian tubes. And another clue to ruptured ectopic pregnancy would also be free fluid in the pelvis. So how are we going to manage these patients? Well, you're gonna to wanna to think about, is your patient stable or unstable? In your stable patients, you're definitely wanna gonna get uh, IV access and OBGYN consultation. And OBGYN is gonna sort of help determine whether your patient's gonna receive medical management or surgical management. Medical management would be with the medication such as methotrexate, which halts cellular division of the ectopic pregnancy and ultimately leads to a termination of that pregnancy. Or surgical management, such as salpingostomy, in which there is a cut that is placed within the fallopian tube and removal of the ectopic pregnancy versus a salpingectomy, which is a total removal of the fallopian tube. In your unstable patients, you're also going to wanna to get immediate IV access and begin resuscitation with blood products. And you're gonna to wanna to think about your, your airway, your breathing, your circulation, and the other things that we do as amazing emergency medicine providers. You're also going to get a emergent OBGYN consultation for definitive surgical intervention. What are some disparities in healthcare within ruptured ectopic pregnancies? Well, Black and Hispanic women are 20% less likely to receive tubal sparing surgeries compared to white women. This obviously has huge implications for their futures as it can affect future pregnancies. Asians, American Indians, Native Hawaiians, Hispanic, and Black women also have been shown to have a significantly higher risk of ectopic, ectopic pregnancy-related complications, such as bleeding, such as hemodynamic instability, and such as longer hospital stays. So this is something that you're gonna to wanna to be aware of as, as future providers and making sure you're taking the best care of all patients who present to the emergency department. Let's move on to our second case. A 35 year old female who is a G3P2 at 32 weeks gestation presents to the emergency department via EMS after being involved in a motor, motor vehicle collision. She was a restrained driver of a vehicle that was hit from behind at 60 miles per hour. She comes in complaining of severe abdominal pain, low back pain, and has noticed some vaginal spotting while in the ambulance. 
So let's think about what pregnancy complication is on our differential. Well, we're absolutely going to think about a placental abruption. This occurs when the implanted placenta separates from the uterus and can cause external and both internal bleeding. The etiology of placental abruptions is actually pretty poorly understood, but it is thought to be linked to things such as abdominal trauma, such as in motor vehicle accidents or with chronic hypertension. This diagnosis should be considered in patients um, who are greater than 20 weeks and are presenting with things such as abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, as well as unexplained preterm labor. So how are we going to manage these patients? Again, maternal, res maternal resuscitation comes first and foremost. We're also going to get an OBGYN consult. And you're also going to want to assess the RH status of your patient. As in RH negative mothers who have any exposure to fetal blood that is RH positive, this can create antibodies which can affect future pregnancies. So in those cases, you're going to give anti-D immunoglobin to uh, prevent that alloimmunization. So what are some disparities in care? Well, it has been shown that black women have an increased risk of placental abruptions when compared with white women, even when controlling for coexisting risk factors such as trauma or chronic hypertension. So let's move on to our next case. This is a 28 year old female. She presents to your freestanding ED in active labor. You successfully vaginally deliver the fetus and the placenta without complication. Uh, but you note that she continues to have some vaginal bleeding, but is remaining hemodynamically stable. You start the process of transferring this patient from your freestanding ED to a tertiary care center. And the nurse comes and tells you that the mother has had about 1700 cc's of vaginal bleeding in 45 minutes and she continues to bleed. So what are your next steps? So this of course represents postpartum hemorrhage defined as large volume blood loss after delivery that may also be accompanied by hemodynamic instability, but just like our patient does not have to be accompanied by hemodynamic instability. So our question is, what, what are our next steps? Well, you should think about management stepwise. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is start a uterine massage. The next thing, if that is ineffective, is administer uterotonic medications such as oxytocin or pitocin to help induce clamping of those uterine vessels to help tamponade bleeding. You're also going to wanna to give blood products such as packed red blood cells and FFP to replace the blood that the mother has lost, especially in those who are hemodynamically unstable. If those are still ineffective, you're gonna move on to something like a tamponade device, which again helps tamponade those bleeding vessels. Interventional radiology can also be considered if you are at a facility that has that, that, has that available to help uh, intervene on those uh, blood vessels uh, that are bleeding. And then of course, definitive management would be a hysterectomy. What are some disparities in care for postpartum hemorrhage? Well, Black, Hispanic, and Asian women are more likely to die from postpartum hemorrhage compared to white women, even when adjusting for risk factors. This has been thought to be due to a lack of both adequate recognition and response by healthcare providers. So it is extremely important not only to recognize postpartum hemorrhage, but also to rapidly intervene in order to save our patients' lives. Our final case, you receive an EMS call for medication orders for a 34-year-old female who's having a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. EMS notes that they were called out for headache and blurred vision, and the patient was found to be hypertensive to 190 over 88 before then having a seizure. EMS adds, oh, by the way, this patient also gave birth two weeks ago. So what medication will we instruct EMS to administer? Well, let's first think about exactly what's going on with this patient who gave birth two weeks ago, is hypertensive, and is having a seizure. Well, this is eclampsia, which is on the preeclampsia, eclampsia spectrum. So how do we define 
both preeclampsia and eclampsia? Well, preeclampsia is new onset hypertension that is after 20 weeks gestation and is also accompanied by proteinuria or other signs of in-organ damage, such as headaches, right upper quadrant pain, changes in vision. And then eclampsia is development of seizures in a patient who has preeclampsia. And this can occur all the way up until six weeks postpartum. What are some risk factors for preeclampsia and eclampsia? Well, multifetal gestations, chronic hypertension, gestational diabetes, lupus, as well as elevated BMI, just to name a few. So the question was, how, what medication orders are we going to give EMS? Well, let's first think about how we're going to treat preeclampsia and eclampsia. In patients presenting with preeclampsia, we are going to lower blood pressure to try to also help prevent eclampsia. So we're going to give antihypertensives with the goal of lowering blood pressure to less than 160 over 90. If you have a patient who is uh, still pregnant and not yet in their postpartum period, you're going to want to think about medications such as labetalol, hydralazine, nifedipine, as well as methyl dopa, which are all safe in pregnancy. And the treatment for eclampsia is magnesium sulfate, which is both used in acute seizure treatment, which is the medication order we're going to give to EMS, but is also used for seizure prophylaxis in patients coming in with preeclampsia as well. The definitive treatment for preeclampsia and eclampsia is delivery of the fetus. In terms of disparities in care, Asian and Pacific women have been shown to be at highest risk of acute cardiovascular complications during hospitalization for preeclampsia and eclampsia, even after adjusting for socioeconomic factors and comorbidities. These cardiovascular complications include things such as periopartum cardiomyopathy, such as significant chronic hypertension, acute renal failure, so these are things that you're going to want to consider, especially for caring for these, this patient population and trying to help mitigate those significant complications. So in summary, we're going to always think about ruptured ectopic pregnancy, especially in unstable patients that are presenting with unconfirmed pregnancy locations. In our patients with placental abruption, we're always going to check the RH status and administer anti-D immunoglobin for those patients who are RH negative. It is paramount in postpartum hemorrhage to make sure we're recognizing and addressing that early and often. In patients who are presenting with eclampsia, we're going to use magnesium sulfate uh, as our abortive seizure medication as well as our prophylactic medication in patients presenting with preeclampsia. And we also talked about the many racial and ethnic disparities that exist with the obstetrical care and how we're going to be aware of and advocate for our patients in the future. These are my references. Here are some other additional resources that you can check out for more information regarding these obstetrical emergencies. And that is all. Thank you all so much for your time and good luck with all your future endeavors.